All these lovely faces. We got two pages worth of people. Yeah. We got three. Nice. Great showing. I think so far we have about 39 people. All right. I know that um, Dr. Ocampo has a hard stop, so I just want to be mindful of time. And um, first and foremost, welcome everyone to our uh, Michi and Walter Weblin Endowed Chair Social Justice Webinar Series. And my name is Mary Udenico, Professor of Sociology and the Director of the Weblin Endowed Chair Studies. Uh, it is really my esteemed honor to welcome Dr. Ocampo, that who many of us call as Dr. O. Um, some of you may know him from the department because we're very fortunate to have him as a professor in our department. Um, as an associate professor. And he, um, he and I kind of go way back, you know, from the time that he was in grad school, but he has emerged as a leading scholar on race and in particular with Asian Americans and specifically around Filipino Americans. And in honor and in celebration of Filipino Heritage Month, we asked him if he can come in and unpack some knowledge and share some of his wisdom um, based on the book that he wrote, Filipinos of Asia, you know, um, um, the title of his presentation today is Race is More Than Checking a Box on a Form, How Filipino Americans Navigate Racial Identity. And the way we're going to be structuring it today is that we encourage you and ask you, as some of you are already doing, um, commenting on the chat box. Kelly Wen, Kelly, raise your hand. Um, she's our Weglin intern and um, awesome person overall. And I are going to serve as the chat moderators. And so as we're looking through, we're going to be, you know, inserting some of your questions to Dr. O. Um, unfortunately, he has a meeting right after, but if you have things that you're curious about after this talk and you want to engage more, please reach out to him. And, and again, this video is recorded and it'll be shared with everyone. And for those of you who are able to come to our Tuesday Wagon event, as you know, Michi and Walter Wagon Endowment is promoting um, the notion of social justice, uh, largely defined, but in, re in reality, our committee this year is really committed to um, examining anti-racist as well as the social construction of race and how all of the different communities, not just race and ethnicity, but underserved communities fit into this landscape of social justice. Um, I cannot think of a better person or a, a more accessible colleague and scholar to introduce, so I'd like you all to welcome Dr. Ocampo. Hi, um, everybody. It's nice to see you. Um, I just wanted to give everybody, everyone can hear me, right? Yes, thumbs up. Awesome. I just wanted to give some folks some context about this talk, this research, the book that um, I'm gonna show you a picture of because I think sometimes as you know when I was in your shoes as a student um, I could have never imagined that I'd be here today um, I was an undergrad in the 90s and a little bit of the 2000s but uh, in undergrad you know part of the reason that I wanted to start writing and researching about Filipino Americans is because um, when I was in school, there weren't any offerings. There weren't any courses on Filipino Americans. Um, I remember growing up in Eagle Rock where there was a very strong immigrant community of both Filipinos, Mexican Americans, other Latinx folks. Um, and I, I 
I went from there and then when I moved to the Bay Area to go to undergrad, I was, I went from a super, super diverse um, neighborhood to like a predominantly white space. And that was very much a culture shock because the things that folks would talk about, um, I just didn't understand, like things like going to Europe or riding horses or being in the snow. And so um, this is all to say like all of those like experiences in undergrad that made me very intimidated to be in college. Um, I noticed something. I noticed that when I started to take courses on race and ethnicity, when I started to take ethnic studies classes, um, number one, it just built my academic confidence. And number two, it, it, it made me see that the experiences that I bring to the as a son of immigrants, as a Filipino American, um, it, it, in those spaces, it had value. And so I started to spend um, as much time as possible um, writing about Filipino Americans, you know, in the class that, you're, that some of you take with me, there's there's a lot of, you know, I often ask you to read the readings and then write about it and link it to your own personal experience, even if the reading itself is not uh, a community that you identify with. Um, so literally, when I was an undergrad, I wrote college papers. I found this in my book. Like, see this year? It says 2000, 2003. Um, and you know here's another one from we were in the quarter system 2003 um i just wrote these papers and i didn't think anything of it um but as i started to write these stories my professors uh some of my professors well not all of them because they weren't all supportive but like the supportive ones were like maybe you should write a book about this one day and when i heard that it was just something that like I couldn't even wrap my head around, but it was nice to know that they saw something that was possible that I wasn't. So I just want to start with that story because I think that everybody in here has an incredible story that the world needs to see. Um, and whether it comes in book form or blog form or documentary or a series of tweets, um, th the stories that you tell can have a huge impact on people. So uh, I just want to start with that personal anecdote. Um, and, you know, I know that uh, Dr. Danigo is someone who, for whom that same sentiment about the world resonates, um, because, you know, in her research, she's been um, not just someone that's done a lot of work on 1.5 generation Korean Americans and Asian Americans in general, but she's also someone that I'm very grateful for, for creating space and opportunity and chances to, to share my work. Um, it's just very cool. So I hope that today's talk emboldens you to, to share some of the cool sociological stories that are yet untold. So uh, I'm sharing my desktop. Oh, I'm supposed to share. Okay. Um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint real quick. So I, um, that, that's a picture of the book. And, you know, the title of today's talk is Race is More Than Checking a Box in a Form, How Filipino Americans uh, Navigate Racial Identity. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because um, I had a really interesting experience with that um, checkbox on a form. So you, many of you, when you like register to vote or when you apply to school, maybe when you even apply to a job, you'll often have to fill out um, a form that says, what is your racial background? Um, has anyone had to the, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about? And I'm just curious if folks can chime in in the chat um, or unmute your mic. How many of you have ever been confused when filling out that set of boxes? Denise says, me all the time. Dr. D says, yes. Anthony, yes. Wow, to this day, yeah, yeah. Professor Barrigan, I was confused with being Asian or Pacific Islander. Yeah, so I'm gonna actually piggyback on something that Kelly, Kelly Ann Lopez said, because that was my experience of what, what box do I pick? Um, in California, Filipinos tend to have their own box, but then in other places, it's like um, white, black, African-American, Latino slash Hispanic, um, Asian, Pacific Islander, other, etc. And so I was always um, 
a little bit hesitant to check the Asian box because in my head I was like, well, Filipino, like when you say Asian, I don't think people are thinking of Filipinos. But then I was also like, do I pick Pacific Islander? Because maybe Pacific Islander refers to like people from Samoa or Tonga. So anyway, what I learned in my research is that that experience of, of what box to pick, it ends up being a very anxiety producing experience for a lot of people not just Filipinos so um, that was the motivation of wanting to, to, to do this book um, but before I go on I know that you know a lot of you have a sense of who Filipino Americans are um, but I wanted to give you some background so Filipino Americans um, this number is probably increasing when we have this new census but as, as of the last census there are about 3.5 million Filipino Americans in the United States, um, about 100,000 of them would be uh, undocumented Filipino Americans that are living here that aren't counted by the census, but I wanted to make sure to include them in this number. Filipino Americans, a lot of people don't know, are the second largest Asian group um, behind Chinese Americans, and actually fairly recently have been, um, is this the right word, overtaken <laughs> by Indian Americans um, as the second largest immigrant group. But it's still sort of up in the air which group is um, the second largest because if you count uh, Filipinos that are multiracial, then the number of Filipinos exponentially, like it increases a lot. Uh, whereas that's not so much the case with, with uh, Indian Americans. And finally, um, there is this sort of undertone that Filipino Americans are the forgotten Asian American, right? So when people hear the word Asian, you know, they're often thinking about Chinese, Japanese, Korean folks. Um, and it's not always the case that Filipinos are included for a variety of reasons that I'm gonna talk about today. So um, this is a really way to, uh, to it's a really silly way to phrase a research question, but I think it, it kind of works. And it actually was the question that one of my professors when I was in grad school said, why don't you just explore this question? So the research question that's driving today's talk is just seriously like, are Filipino, you know, you'll notice that I'm typing Filipinx American. Um, I'll intersperse between saying Filipino and Filipinx, but are Filipino Americans really Asian, right? Are Filipino Americans really Asian? I know that Filipinos are technically part of the Asian box. When it came to the Asian American movement in the 1960s, Filipinos were front and center as part of that movement in, the, in those organizations. At the same time, the Philippines is different from a lot of Asian countries because it was a former colony of Spain. So that's why I have a last name like Ocampo. Um, Kellyanne, are you, I, I'm assuming you're Filipino based off this. Hi. Um, yes, I am Filipino. Um, my dad's side, their last name is Lopez, while my mom's side is Pontino. Oh, see, like those are very, very Spanish last names, right? And, you know, when it comes to the way we, like, I can't tell you how many students are like, I enrolled in your class. I saw your last name, Ocampo, so I assumed that you were like Latino, but you're, you're not. So, um, you know, like the last name can also signal racial identity. So um, it's, a, it's a silly question, but it's one that's actually driven um, the, research, um, the research for this, this talk. Another thing I started to notice with Filipino Americans, I realized that it wasn't just me who started to feel this way. Um, there was a lot of data that showed um, that Filipinos are like confused when it comes to what box to check. Back in the day before Facebook and TikTok and Instagram, we used to have this thing called MySpace. Has anyone heard of it? Raise your hand. Um, and I distinctly remember this memory of a friend, um, one of my friends, when I went to his MySpace page, on MySpace on your profile, you, you could put like, your, your gender, your, 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 your ethnicity. And for his ethnicity, I noticed that he put mixed. And then another friend who was Filipino um, put other. But a lot of other Filipinos were putting like, you know, all sorts of things that weren't Asian. So I thought, oh, it's just, it's not just me. And I actually wanna share a story that did happen to me that actually illustrates why this question is a legit question to ask. So here's a, picture of a bar. <laughs> anyway, so when I was in UCLA, in my last year of the program, I was in grad school for, oh my gosh, seven years. Um, took a long time. In my last year, my most brokest, brokest year 
at in grad school. I had been out of college for seven years. I wasn't really working. I was just like a TA. Um, and so money was, I have this funny picture at the Wells Fargo by the UCLA where I look up my my bank account and a friend took a picture. It says like zero dollars in your savings and negative two in your checking. And that was like where I was at when I saw this flyer in grad school. It said alcohol study. Do you drink alcohol regularly? Um, yeah. And are you Asian American? Yes. So I saw this and I, I mean, what I really caught my attention was that huge number on the bottom. $215 for me was like, this is hitting the jackpot. So I end up calling, uh, calling the, the coordinator of the study. I said, hey, I'm Asian American. I'm eligible for your study. And I set my appointment to go like do the study. And then right before we were about to hang up, um, I had mentioned to the, to the researcher that I was Filipino, at which point she said, oh, I'm sorry, you're not eligible for the study. And I said, why is that? And she said, it's because um, we can only have Chinese, Japanese, and Korean participants. And I was like, but your flyer says Asian American, like, and my parents are from the Philippines. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry, we need a genetically similar sample. So here is the situation that this UCLA researcher um, in the sciences that was telling me, oh, you're not really Asian because you have the wrong genetics. But as we know in sociology, What's that phrase we always say? Race is what? Is it a genetic construct or what? It's a social construct. Social construct, right? Human beings, people, organizations are the ones that define um, who is part of a category, right? So this was an example, even though she was using the word genetics, this is an example in which she was socially constructing who counts as Asian and who's not. And this is an experience that happens to Filipinos all the time. There was a research um, survey that was conducted back in the early 2000s. And when they asked Asian, a group of Asian Americans, children of immigrants, what is your racial background? People who were Chinese, people that were Vietnamese and people that were Korean, 95% of them chose Asian as their racial background. But when you looked at the ones who are of Filipino descent, can you guess the number? Throw it in the chat. What do you think? What percentage of Filipino Americans I chose Asian as the racial background? We got 60, 80, 70, 85, 20. Oh, these are all over the place. Some people are also saying 20, 33, accidentally privately messaging me. Is it oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, 45. yeah. Uh -huh. Wendy, if I had a prize to give out, I think you're the closest. 40% without, you know, Price is Right rules not going over. 45% of Filipino Americans chose Asian as their racial background. In fact, 48% chose Pacific Islander as their racial background. And so why is it the case that a group this is a sociological puzzle. Why is it the case that a group that was part of the Asian American movement that is technically categorized as Asian American, um, that is involved in Asian American organization, why is it less than half of them choose Asian American? That's the question we're gonna answer today. Well, part of the reason is that we have to think about race as more than just a box we check on a form. So, in sociology, we often say that there are these rules, there's these um, like unwritten rules for who, who counts as part of a race. If you think about it, how we categorize people by race, it's based on a constellation of different factors. It could be the box you check on the form, but it could also be the skin color, it could be the way people speak, it could be the way people look to other people, it could be hair texture, um, it could be the way they speak, um, like with an accent or not accented. All of these things play a role in how we determine who is part of what racial category. How many of you have ever been on a phone call and you've called someone and based just off their voice, you've tried to guess what race ethnicity they are, or you sort of are assuming what race ethnicity they are, right? Um, a bunch of people are raising their hands. It's true. And there, this is a situation that shows that race isn't just about what you look like, 
we have very we have cues about what racial categories are based off other um, factors. In fact, there's a research study conducted on blind um, blind people that shows that people that don't have vision can actually distinguish racial differences purely on voice. Um, the other part is race is something that is context dependent. So, for example, I might be here in the in Los Angeles, and people will see me as Filipino American, but if I go to the Philippines, all of a sudden my identity changes and because everyone's Filipino, so now I become American, right? If um, for some people that are um, like, my, I, there's a lot of people that I interviewed for this book that said, you know, sometimes my race changes depending on one part of LA I'm in. So I had uh, one, one respondent that said, you know, if I'm like in, East LA or a predominantly Latino area, everyone assumes that I'm Latino, but I'm in like Orange County or other places where the context is different, people will make other guesses about who I am. And finally, I just want to underscore that race, even though there's a lot of folks that try to say that race um, doesn't exist or, you know, this was more relevant when I wrote the book. I think it's very clear that race exists um, from what we're seeing on the news. But yeah, um, race is something that affects every aspect of everyday life. So that's part of the reason I felt this was an important study because how people read Filipinos has all sorts of implications for their, their friendship groups, their dating life, their workplace, et cetera, et cetera. So getting back to that question about like, are Filipinos really Asian? Um, I asked, one of the people that I interviewed, a young woman from Carson, California, and her answer really underscored a big reason why I think Filipino Americans that I interviewed were so hesitant to choose Asian as their racial background. So this isn't her, it's just like a stock photo from the from like Getty images. So um, it's not actually her. All respondents we kept anonymous to protect their, like, to maintain confidentiality. But um, I asked her and she said this phrase that I heard over and over from people again, Filipinos are the Mexicans of Asia. And part of the reason she said this is because um, she said, it's hard for me to think of myself as Asian because we were colonized by Spain for 300 years. She said culturally she felt closer to Latinos than she did to other Asians. So I thought that there was something um, I thought there was something to that. And I wanna make sure that I pause here to see if there are any questions. I know that I'm getting some questions in my private chat, but if anyone had any questions before I move on, I wanna just pause for a second. Adriana had her hand up. I don't know if you still have a question, Adriana. I noticed that you had your hand up. Mm. Okay, maybe no longer. Okay, all right. Yeah, if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and Dr. D and Kelly will um, let me know that they have a question. So anyway, Filipinos are the Mexican of Asia. Um, raise your hand if you ever heard some someone make this joke that Filipinos are like the Mexicans of Asia. All the time, actually, yeah. Tell me more, Alexander, What what in what context did it come up? Uh, pretty much like, um, when, um, when I was in high school, mostly because like, I don't know if I said this like on like during one of your classes, but when I, I went to Diamond Bar High mm -hmm. and, and there like there was, um, there was like a, a lot of a Asians at the school and mm -hmm. I even hear it um, like whenever I hear them speak like um, they just say, um, they just tell each other amongst themselves that like, um, oh, like, um, like Japanese are, are one thing, Chinese is another. And if you're Filipino, then like you're, you're like the Mexicans. Uh, uh, of Asia and stuff. I just, I just heard it um, everywhere when I was um, in the entire time when I was like, when I went to, to Dunbar High, so. And it starts off as a joke, but you know, those sort of understandings of, of like certain Asians are like the legit Asians and others are like kind of different Asians. Those things matter a lot. Kellyanne, I saw your hand. Is it Kelly or Kellyanne? Hi, it's Kelly, but my first full name is Kelly Ann, but I prefer Kelly. Okay. Um, so in high school, someone actually called me um, a confused Mexican, but I'm really Filipino. I'm full Filipino. And that stuck with me. Like, why are you calling me a confused Mexican? Uh-huh. Yeah, that is a very, um, like, not only did they, 
not see you the way that you self-identify. They were imposing the fact that you were a, like a underperform, like you were a Mexican that just wasn't claiming it, which obviously is something you, you it stuck to you and you remember it. Um, Roxanne noted in the chat that uh, she works in a Latino coffee shop and you don't speak Spanish. Um, and you know, that leads to implications as well. <laughs> wow, that's VS, yeah, sorry for other people's ignorance. Yeah, and, it, and this is an example of how like race can have moments that can lead us, like very, lead to very emotional um, interactional moments. So I wanna touch on this idea of Filipinos, like this, this, like tease out this joke that people often have that Filipinos are the Mexicans of Asia, because even though it is a joke, there is, there's a lot that goes into that that I think a lot of people don't know. Um, there's this wonderful William Faulkner phrase that I absolutely love. It's the past is not dead. It's not even past. And it's this idea that like, even though we think of things like colonialism as something that's from like years ago or decades ago or even centuries ago, um, colonialism is something that still affects the everyday experiences of folks, even to this day, definitely on a cultural level. So um, for those that are um, unfamiliar with Filipino history, there's this phrase that they say in the Philippines that Filipinos spent 300 years in the convent and 50 years in Hollywood. And it's because the, the three centuries of Spanish colonialism in the Philippines, which was actually mostly Mexican influence because Spain hired Mexico to run the Philippines. That's the way it actually was run. So actually a lot of the similarities between Philippines Filipinos and Latinos is actually um, the, the, the Mexican influence. So Philippines is a predominantly Catholic country. We got last names like Lopez, Ocampo, um, Rodriguez, Torres. Um, and, you know, other, there's a lot of overlap between like the cultural markers of Filipino-ness and, and Latin America. A lot of people say when they go to the Philippines and they've been to Latin America, they say, wow, it, it feels very much like Latin America there. Um, of course, the, the, the United, the, after the Spanish colonialism, the Philippines was then colonized by the United States for a half century. That's why the 50 years in Hollywood. And that did a whole lot of things because it made English the medium of instruction. It means a lot of people in the Philippines speak English. Um, and those are, you know, two big factors that affect how people understand the Asian American experience. Um, often people assume Asian Americans to be inherently bilingual. They can speak English and Vietnamese. They can speak English and Chinese. And so a lot of Filipinos get boxed out of that experience because their parents, for the most part, speak English. So they didn't learn Tagalog uh, to the same degree. Um, I have a thing in the chat, Dr. Campo, you may know this, but Ocampo is my mother's. Oh. Ocampo is my mother's maiden name, so maybe somewhere we share lineage. Oh, we should do the ancestry.com thing. Maybe we're, maybe we're cousins. <laughs> we might anyway. be. <laughs> uh huh. That's so funny. That's like the quintessential Filipino experience. You're like, you meet someone at the grocery store or like in public, and you're like, oh my god, we're related. Um. Anyway, so, yeah. Um, the point is, both Spanish colonialism and American colonialism, it led to all of these cultural legacies that affect the way people categorize Filipinos racially. And so when I was doing my interviews, I ended up interviewing over 80 Filipino Americans whose parents were immigrants, but they were born here in the United States, or they were um, like Dr. Danico's research um, talks about 1.5 generation, which means they came uh, at a very young age here. And the ways in which I saw Filipino identity come up was, in four arenas, phenotype, language, religion, and networks. So when I would pose the question to Filipino Americans that I interviewed and I would, oops, where'd it go? When I would say, do you feel like Filipinos are part of the Asian American category? They would say yes or no, and they would frame their answers around these four themes. It would often be about what people look like, it would be about language, um, about religion and networks. I'm actually gonna be do doing something different here, and I'm gonna focus on the responses where Filipinos said that they don't feel Asian. In sociology, when we do surveys, um, we're often, or we do research, we're often interested in the way people identify 
And it's less common that we actually focus on the way people disidentify. And so what I want to do is actually focus on the disidentification of Filipinos, because I think it tells a lot about the way everyday people, Filipino and non-Filipino, understand identity. So let me start with phenotype. Um, ah, where's my cursor? Here we go. So here's a bunch of photos of friends and family of mine. And, you know, it's my cousin Paul and my friend Nelson. Um, I, I wanted to show people that are part of my family and part of my friend group. Everyone in this group is Filipino, but they're also a group of people that have said in their experience, people often miscategorize them based on, you know, a variety of factors. They've gotten everything from Latino to um, Caribbean to uh, multi, like multiracial to uh, Eight, like some other Asian group. And it's often the experience of Filipinos, like one of the most common experiences of Filipinos is that people just can't figure out who they are. Um, oh, thank you, um, Elizabeth. <laughs> so this idea of what people look like came up as an answer among the people I interviewed. So um, one of the gentlemen that I interviewed who I call Caesar. He's from Carson, California as well. He says, location matters. He said, if we're in a Hispanic place, people assume I'm Mexican. It happens a lot to Filipinos, especially to my cousin. He just looks Mexican, but he's Filipino. We both have that Spanish influence. We both have that Spanish blood. Sometimes we look Hispanic or Latino, right? So this is an example of, of how, because of the like, confusion like when when you see someone and you can't categorize them by race what happens our brains look at them and they try to follow certain cues to determine what category they're part of so if you know if caesar is in a, what he calls a hispanic place people might say oh i can't tell what this person is but we're in this particular neighborhood so let me just assume that you know they're uh, they're they're latino um and so what ends up happening is Filipinos accumulate these moments where people mistake them as Latino or Hispanic, and they need to come up with some rationale of like, why is it that I'm technically part of this like Asian category, but people are labeling me Hispanic. So it makes people remember that the Philippines was a, was a former colony of Spain. And then they'll, make, they'll say things like, oh, Filipinos have Spanish blood, which is technically not really true. Most Filipinos don't have any Spanish blood because the, the primary folks that were there um, colonizing the Philippines were religious friars and priests who in theory are not supposed to be um, having families with people. Of course, my mom knew a priest that had kids. Like, stuff happened, but like a big reason that um, it's not like Puerto Rico or Mexico where there's a lot of racial mixing, but yet this narrative of like racial mixing is one that comes up with Filipinos all the time because they always get mistaken as uh, something else. The other part about, um, that's just one example. And during Q&A, folks have questions. Oh, like, tell me other stories of that. I'll, I'll feel free to move on, but I'm just going to focus on one example or maybe two examples for each of these categories. So with language, you know, language was another reason why Filipinos said that they were different from Asians. So they said, you know, real Asians, their languages have characters so like Korean, uh, Chinese, Japanese, like those are real, um, real Asians. And they have like real Asian letterings. With Filipinos, we use Roman lettering for our language, right? So people would say things like that. But another thing that Filipinos would say, and this is in part because of where Filipinos lived, like Eagle Rock, Carson, um, West Covina, San Fernando Valley, these are places where Filipinos live alongside with Mexican Americans, other Latinos, um, people that speak Spanish. And one thing they realize from growing up in these neighborhoods. And this is why it's very like California phenomenon. Um, they start to hear people talk in Spanish and they hear people speak in Tagalog. And they will think about like everyday words that they'll hear, like table, fork, and spoon. And they'll notice that when their mom or dad say these words in Tagalog, 
they'll see like Mesa, Tenedor, Cuchara, right? And then they'll see someone who's a Latino immigrant speaking Spanish or someone who can speak Spanish and they'll hear the same exact words. Days of the week are the same. Lunes, martes, miércoles, jueves, viernes. Um, pants, pantalones, shoes, zapatos, shirt, camiseta, camisa, right? These are words that overlap between Spanish and Tagalog. So when they're seeing these moments in action, they can't help but think, what is going on? Like, why are there so many, um, why are there so many words that overlap? And what this shows is that the, where Filip the fact that Filipinos live alongside Latinos, it reignites that, that memory that Filipinos were a colony of Spain. Let me give you a different example. My friend, my cousins that, that grew up in like New Jersey and places where there weren't a lot of those, they don't have the same sensibilities about the connection between Filipinos and Latinos because they didn't witness them as, they didn't witness them on an everyday basis in the same way that folks in LA did. So this is where geography really matters a lot. I've already mentioned that last names, you know, here is a group of Spanish last names. And, you know, for the Filipinos that are in this group or anyone that knows Filipinos, you know that you got family members with these last names or you got friends with these last names. Like Lopez, we have a Lopez in this room. Um, Alvarez, Fernandez, Vasquez. And this stuff matters too, even beyond like, this is another example of how race matters beyond just like a box on a form or what you look like. Because as I mentioned, when students enroll in my class and they've never met me, they assume that like I'm Mexican American or I'm, I'm Latinx. Um, and you know, think about the concept of like applying for a job. How do you apply for a job? What's the one thing you need to submit when you apply for a job? An application. An application. And this other piece of paper, what do we call it? Oh, resume. A resume, yes. And on the resume, you have your name featured very prominently at the top. And we know that there's research that shows that employers will try to determine people's race based off the name. That happens for Black versus white. That happens for Latino, Asians as well. So when people, if you were to, you know, if you were an employer and you got, um, if you got on your desk the resume from Marianne Fernandez, What's going to be your first assumption about Marianne's ethnic or racial identity? She's Latinx. Some say Filipino. Yeah, if we're like in um, Carson, maybe you'll, you're like, you have enough exposure to Filipinos, right? Um, Adriana says she's white and Mexican. Adriana, why'd you say white and Mexican? Because her name is Marianne. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, Latina, right? Um, so in other words, it's, you know, I could, Marianne could be a, someone that's from, you know, whose parents' entire lineage is from the Philippines, but based on the last name, you're gonna think something else. Of course, um, anyone that knows, um, has been like spent any time in any Latino communities or Filipino communities knows that religion is a prominent feature of those communities. Even if people aren't religious themselves, religion is very visible. So I'm not, uh, so like we think about like a household, um, like my parents' household is religious things everywhere. Statues, rosaries, um, you know, all of our cars have a rosary hanging from the thing. And we often forget that like religion is something, even though we think of it as like, going to Sunday services, it's also something that's tied to ethnic and racial identity. So when I asked Filipinos, do you feel like Filipinos are Asian? Some people gave the answer, well, actually, um, no, be and the, the reason is because of religion. Even though there are Asian American Catholics, religion was something that they associated with Latinos. So when I asked um, Inez, who was a web designer from Eagle Rock, I said, who do you think um, Filipinos are closer to culturally? And she said, definitely Latinos. There's a lot of that strict Catholicism stuff. My parents and grandparents were very into having saints and the Virgin Mary in our house. And that's just like Latinos. There's a lot of culture and religion intermingled. 
Another uh, woman from Carson said, when you hear Filipino or Latino, you think Catholic automatically. I don't think this is, and this is where people's stereotypical thinking about um, other ethnic and racial groups sometimes came out and not necessarily in a, a good way. So she said, I don't think of religion when I think of Asians. If I do, maybe I think of Buddha, but not Jesus or Mary, right? So she did this very Orientalist view of, uh, of who other Asians were. And for the record, there are a lot of Asian American, Asian uh, in Christianity and Catholicism, but the way in which Asianness is constructed, it's constructed in her head as something that's not related to Catholicism. So yeah, Peter, uh, Dr. Hanek is like, tell that to the Vietnamese. Actually, Dr. Hanek is right. Vietnamese have uh, the largest, uh, like the largest segment of Catholics. It's Filipinos obviously are the largest, but Vietnamese is like 30 plus percent of Vietnamese are actually um, identify as Catholic. So thank you for pointing that out. Finally, um, part of, part of um, identity also had to do with who you're friends with. So one of the things that ended up becoming a finding um, was who, where, like the way in which Filipinos understood their interactions with other ethnic and racial groups played a role in how they identified. Let me be more clear. Um, Filipinos would often talk about like um, when they would go to like their friends' houses, right? Um, some of them said something like, oh, when I go to my friend's house and you know, their family's Mexican, there's something about the, the way the household is, the interaction there that makes it seem very familiar, right? Even if the parents themselves didn't, um, didn't speak uh, English and only spoke Spanish, that was another time in which Filipino people, Filipinos that I interviewed would say, oh, I can actually catch a few of the words that they're saying. Um, beyond just interviewing Filipinos, I actually interviewed, um, whenever I've talked about this book with some of my students, there's, um, there's one in particular who said something funny. She said something to the effect of, um, you know, when I, with my Filipino friends, like when I introduce them to my family, I just say, this is my friend. But I noticed with my other, uh, with my Asian friends, I always say, this is my Chinese friend, or this is my Japanese friend. And that's something that she doesn't do with Filipinos. And so it's a, it's a hard thing to kind of think about, but it was the, the non-newsworthiness of Filipino-Latino interactions that ended up becoming a finding uh, for this book. Even though Filipinos are categorized as Asian, there was a time around the 1960s where it wasn't clear what Filipinos were. And for a time, people were debating, people at the census, um, activists, bureau bureaucrats were deciding, what do we do with this group of Filipinos? Because there was no Latino category either. They used to call them Spanish surname people. That was the old way they constructed um, Latino. It was Spanish surname people, in which case Filipinos would fit. Part of the reason Filipinos and Latinos also had a sense of closeness is because they were very much um, in conversation during the, the farm worker labor movements um, started by this dude who you all know is Cesar Chavez. A uh, lesser known person to the person right is Larry Itliang, um, who is a, you know, is, is a, the one that Cesar Chavez collaborated with um, to like strike in the Central Valley. Anyway, these labor organizing movements create a lot of closeness between Filipinos and, and, and Mexican and Americans in particular. But even beyond the labor stuff, one of the funny ways in which um, Filipinos like sense of closeness with Latinos became like started to show prominently was when people talked about dating. Um, they would they would often say like, oh, like there are certain cultural similarities, religious similarities that make it easier to date someone who's Latino versus someone that was of a different, if they were going to date someone that's not Filipino, they would say like dating someone who's Latino felt like it was as close to dating a Filipino because of certain family, cultural, and religious similarities. And that really became clear in uh, an interview with Nelson. Um, this is the last story I'm going to share before I go to Q&A, but um, Nelson is one of the people I interviewed and the way I like to describe him is he was this sort of self-proclaimed like ladies man 
or like Mac Daddy kind of personality. And so after our interview was done, I was really surprised to to that he he asked this question to me. He was like, "Hey, like you want to like go grab a grab a drink after?" And I was like, "Sure." And he's, he wanted to get my advice on, on dating. And he said, I'm kind of nervous about the girl I'm dating. She's Vietnamese. So this is the first time I'm dating someone from a different race, which I thought was a really funny comment because we know Filipinos and Vietnamese are technically both Asian. But it was the, it was the fact that in our interview, Nelson had talked about the fact that he had dated two other women, both of whom were Mexican. So I asked him about that. I said, well, wait, didn't you just say your last two girlfriends were Mexican? And he said, that doesn't count. Mexicans are the same as Filipinos. So um, there was an illustration of like, even though Filipinos and Mexicans are part of two different racial boxes, you know, Filipinos are the Asian box, Mexicans are the Latino box. There was a moment in which their sense of closeness came about when people would think about something like their intimate dating circles. So um, that's the last quote I'm going to share, uh, but I do wanted to share two more things before I open up to larger convo. Um, some of you might be thinking, like, who cares? Like, so what if Filipinos, you know, a lot, like, what does it even matter? And I think part, one arena in which, like, how Filipinos identify matters is in politics and social movements. Since the 1960s, the way in which people have tried to garner support for social movements is often rallying people around the shared experience of race and ethnicity. And in the center of this photo of this old time magazine is a gentleman by the name of Jose Antonio Vargas. He's an undocumented immigrant um, who often because of his name, Jose Antonio Vargas, is assumed to be Mexican. But Jose Antonio Vargas migrated to the United States at the age of eight from the Philippines. But what's funny about Jose Antonio Vargas is because of, I, th I think in large part because of the way he reads racially, because of his name, it's allowed him to become like one of the leading faces for a social movement that's predominantly associated with Latinos. In fact, back in the day in, this, in the Huffington Post, whenever Jose Antonio Vargas would write articles for the Huffington Post, if you look here, they would always categorize his stories as part of Latino voices. So um, I say this because, um, you know, in this, in this historical moment, even though there's a large number of Filipinos, Filipinos are still relatively invisible in the larger imaginary. And I think one of the ways in which visibility can be achieved is of course, becoming a public figure and running for office. And so if a Filipino were ever, like someone, if a Filipino politician were ever to reach out to me and ask for a consultation, I would say, you know, one of the best ways that you can garner support is to actually harness the similarities between Filipino and Latino identity. I think if folks did that more um, intentionally, it would not only allow them to like break down the barriers between a group that's in a different racial box, it would also be like get folks in the habits of seeing how their stories overlap with other people's stories so that they can band together to get, you know, really positive work um, accomplished. So power of numbers. Um, finally, I just wanted to do a quick um, shout out, like, uh, not shout out, trailer. Um, when I did this study on Filipino Americans, I was doing it because there was a lot of other research studies about um, children of immigrants. And one thing I noticed in my research um, at the time and even in the older research is that um, I had respondents that I interviewed who identified as part of the LGBTQ community. What I noticed is that queer perspectives um, were never represented in those books about children of immigrants. And so um, when I finished writing this book about race, I started to do a whole new project when I got to Cal Poly about um, queer children of immigrants. Um, so I just wanted to quickly share that because, you know, if anyone's wondering what I'm working on, um, what I worked on after, um, that research led to me doing um, a related project about, you know, growing up in LA, but looking at it from the perspective of people that are both brown and queer. So um, I just want to thank folks for listening. Ah, shoot, what I do? 
I just want to thank folks for listening and yeah, I'm just uh oh. LA where I grew ah, up. What happened? LA where I grew up. A lot of let's so mm. on Philly. Grew up in an Oops. so sorry. You have music to end your talk. That's kind of cool. <laughs> um, okay, so I um, I would like to open it up for any questions. Yeah, Kayla, let's give Dr. O a round of applause. You can use your emojis, or you can actually. Why don't we unmute ourselves so he can hear our uh, oh. applause? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah. I think that's oh, really. I like Elizabeth. I was like, who's like, it's Liz. Yeah. I know we know each other. Like, I know you're yeah. Liz. I'm like, all <laughs> names there. So, hey, Liz. <laughs> hey. Yeah. When I saw that you were uh, having a little talk, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll definitely join that conversation because <laughs> your research is interesting and I can't wait till that comes out so I could see what you wrote. Thank you. What you found. Yeah. Yeah, his first book is out, so you can look at the oh. one that the flyer is supposed to, that's a cover of his book. Um, okay. But his second research on, um, you know, growing up with um, Filipino parents as queer sons, I think that's what he's working on right now. So the first book is okay. out. Um, you can definitely read it. Um, he's been interviewed um, on multiple different platforms, you know, regarding that. And so um, I think it's been really received really well, both publicly as an accessible work of scholarship, but among scholars too. Mm -hmm. I think what's really great about um, Dr. O's work is that, and this presentation is, I think you all kind of got a glimpse of him as well. Yeah. As Liz pointed out, very good looking family. And I was laughing, I was muted because I know most of the people on there, I'm like, hey, <laughs> they're on there because I, I was able to meet them. But I think it does shed light. I think a lot of the folks here were also talking about how they resonate it, you know, being um, for, you know, for Mexican Americans or Latino communities, they also face that racial ambiguity, ambiguity questions as well as Arab Americans and so forth. So I think folks felt that they can relate to uh, what you were presenting, Dr. O. Um, just wanted to see if any of you had questions or just comments or, you know, things that you would just want to kind of engage Dr. Owen. And, um, and Dr. Hannock is here too. And, you know, I was going to ask him to expand on his comment about, yeah, tell that to the Vietnamese. And I was going to ask him to participate. So please join in the conversation because I think that's, even though we're virtual, if we were live, we would be in conversation. So please um, ask questions, comment, or share your own stories. So if I can jump in. Uh... Yeah, I always think it's funny uh, when I when I hear Anthony talking about this work because I resonate so much with me, uh, even though I'm not Filipino. Um, I often was assumed to be growing up. Um, it didn't help that uh, that I, well, Dr. Ocampo and I actually went to the same high school. Oh uh, yeah, we actually, went to high school together. One second. Yeah. He's gonna pull out the yearbook. Oh no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and uh, when I went when I went to high school. Yeah, yeah. There you it. go. Open up the page, Anthony. It. Open oh, up the page. Let's oh, that's so it. embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> you no, see, you. Like, you shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, all mean. my friends growing up were Filipino, so people mm -hmm. would. Can I show your senior portrait? Oh, sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay. <sighs> Is it uh, there? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. That's that's me. There's. Can you get that camera? Oh, there. Yeah, there, there, there I am. Yeah, so oh, okay, okay. Now you got to show yours too, Anthony. I know, so it's only fair. It's only fair. <laughs> um, but I, what I was going to say was that I think that, was, aside from this embarrassment, um, that uh, I, I, I'm, as like someone who's Hapa, like I think that there's a, there's a lot of similar dynamics mm -hmm. at play of this idea of racial ambiguity growing up. Um, you know, I'm like, Part Puerto Rican, and I'm part Japanese. I'm part like whatever you want me to be. I'm part of that, um, and so like people would frequently make assumptions about me based upon again this context thing, right? Like, like where I was. Like I, I volunteered when I was in high school. At, like my my mom's a nurse. I volunteered at a hospital when I was in high school. There's obviously lots and lots of Filipino nurses. And so like, you know, you'd have these women coming up to me speaking Tagalog and I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> um, my sister's Filipina, I'm adopted and so, so is she. And so like when we would go together, people would assume like 
like, okay, you're Fil she's Filipino, you're Filipino. Um, so I think that like I think that people who are mixed have similar kinds of dynamics. Yeah, yeah actually, and this just to be fair, this is me. Can you see it? I'm in the middle. Ah. Yeah. I had hair. <laughs> um, yeah. You look pretty much the same. <laughs> but you know, Peter, what's interesting, Dr. Hannix, excuse me, um, what I'm what I'm what's fascinating what you're saying is because there wasn't a lot of sociological work on Filipinos at the time, I actually was very influenced by the research on multiracial individuals. So a lot of the work that was about multiracial individuals was what like helped me think through what was going on with Filipinos. I know it's different because with multiracial individuals, it's not about like Filipinos, like they trace their heritage to a specific country, whereas multiracial folks, it's probably more than one country, so it's, that's different. But the way, the feelings of like the people, confusing people or um, feeling in between, those are definitely takeaways that I got from that sociological research. Yeah, I don't know if I share this with you, um, Dr. O, but you know, my, my mom, who's actually my mother-in-law, but I call her my mom, she did her 23andMe and she was 99% Filipino. Wow. Yeah. I was like, wow, <laughs> that was pretty shocking. You know, and then for, for myself being multi-ethnic, I, I was thinking of the same thing as Dr. H is that, you know, for mixed race folks or multiracial, multi-ethnic people is that um, we could be anything. So even when I go to the Philippines, they'll think I'm Filipino and other Filipinos will say, no, you don't look Filipino. And then others will say, yeah, you totally look Filipino. So it's just interesting. I can go to Hong Kong, go to Taiwan, go to Thailand. I'm, I'm that community because people see what, what they see, right? Yeah. Um, and the notion of that context that you framed is so important. Um, a lot of people are commenting that you are, you're both kings from your yearbooks, good Perfect. memories. Um, and it's cool that you're both professors at Cal Poly or some of the comments. So one last, one last thing that I, I, I put in the chat uh, and I, I just think was interesting too, is that at least experience that I had growing up was that I would often be racialized as whatever my observer was not. Right. So like when I was, uh, I used to teach, high, I taught high school in East LA, um, like pretty much like all Mexican and like they call me Chino, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. they're like, okay, so like you're clearly not Mexican because we're Mexican and we know what Mexicans look like and you're not that. Mm -hmm. But then like other people would see me and say like, oh, well, you're part Asian, you're, you must be Asian or oh, you see, they say you must be Filipino. And it like, depending upon the observer, mm -hmm. they, would, they would kind of exclude, right? There's like, I don't know what you are, but I know you're not me. Yeah, I'm wondering, Peter, because a lot of the ones I interviewed, um, sorry, Dr. Hanek, <laughs> um, I'm wondering about um, whether you ever felt like, ooh, people don't know what I am. Let me play around with this a little bit and have a little fun. Oh, sure. And I think that also, like, I mean, this is complicating things more than maybe you want to, but like, I'm also adopted and I'm adopted, I'm in a, in a multiracial family. Mm -hmm. So my sister's Filipina, my younger brother's black, my younger brother's Mexican, my older brother's Korean. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents are like the whitest people you'll ever meet. And I grew <laughs> up in Inglewood, like, so I grew up in like a black neighborhood. So it's like, there's lots of stuff happening. So like I would, when I was in high school, I kind of put on being Filipino. Ah, because like I felt like that was a thing that I can be now, right? Because mm. people like because people like well, in, at least with being Filipino again, which I wasn't uh -huh. at all, yeah. right? <laughs> but people would be like, "Oh yeah, okay, like I'll I'll buy that." Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, it just yeah, you give you can just say some an easy answer, and it's like, ugh, I'm like freed up of the labor high next week. Yeah, I mean, I obviously I came to realize how deeply problematic that was <laughs> like I, I dropped it immediately <laughs> but like you know, when I was 15 or 16 it was like this is a thing that I could do and people won't ask me weird questions anymore yeah yeah it's yeah. a good thing you dropped it look at all these academics who are claiming to be you know <laughs> black or <laughs> latino or whatever you know so <laughs> thank goodness as adults <laughs> <laughs> what's, inter right. what's yeah, interesting ahead. though is um different from Dr. H is that for me, people made me who they were. So it was op like for Asian Americans and it was um, in Pacific Islanders. So it's interesting, like in Hawaii, they think I'm local. If I, so it's the opposite experience for me uh, where folks claim I was part of them when I wasn't, or I didn't, but later on, it turned out I was for some of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
sorry, Anthony. No, no. Other folks have questions. Oh, you know, one thing I wanted to add is, you know, I've presented this in different forms and it's, I wanted to just share how, when I first started doing this research, how afraid I was to present. Like, I love this work, I love doing it, but there's nothing in the educational system in the curriculum that tells you that studying Filipinos was important. And after many years of just never being discussed in a classroom, I didn't realize how much of an effect that had on me when I started presenting this research. I used to be like, are people gonna care? So I, I do appreciate all the nice comments because I spent maybe a decade and a half feeling like people would never care about this work. And I suspect that there's people out there who have your own versions of your stories that you don't think deserve airtime, but I just wanted to personally, from a personal point of view, share that, you know, those are the best ones, is the ones that you think, you know, uh, you have to hide. It's often those those storylines that I think are the most fascinating and intellectually um, interesting to talk about. So. Yeah, absolutely. Do we have other comments or questions or things that you really wanted to kind of talk about? Thank you for doing your research because that's kind of messed up. <laughs> well, it's very messed up. <laughs> I have a lot of Filipino friends and they matter. I'd like to know about more about them, you know? Thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of the things I never expected. And this is where I think I'm very grateful to Cal Poly, particularly Cal Poly students. Uh, when I first started teaching, I would assign, what I love about Cal Poly students is like, if they like a reading, you can tell. And if they don't, you can tell. And <laughs> like, I'd assign these books and texts that I thought were amazing. And then they'd be like, uh, you know, and then I noticed they start to really react positively to other books. For example, like, um, you know, Victor Rios's book, Punished, as well as um, C.G. Pasco wrote a book on masculinity called Dude, You Are a F Word. <laughs> that rhymes with um, lag. And those books were my, like, the stu I noticed how the students that I was teaching back in the early 2010s, they loved that book. And so when, I, when it was my turn to write a book, I wanted to write something that felt accessible, even if it didn't feel academic. And even in giving these talks, I try to be as cash as possible because I really like what someone said about like you can have fun I'm having fun and learning at the same time like why why not right so um so this is all to say one of the most exciting unexpected things about writing this book is um like I'll get like high school kids that have read the book or high school teachers that assign the book and um you just get these really it's given me the chance to just meet um young Filipinos that I'm what excites me most is that they'll never have to have that feeling of like oh I didn't have a book that resonated they have at least this one to start with and there's a ton of other great you know let me do some shameless plugs for some of my favorite authors uh Filipina Indian poet um just has this wonderful book she wrote about like ethnic and racial identity in nature She's amazing. Um, I can't pronounce her last name, Amy. <laughs> but that's one. Um, my immigration students are reading this book. For those of you not in my class, they, they really love this book. It's about immigrants and children of immigrants. Like, one last book I want to plug, my friend Meredith Toulousan. If you want to talk about identity, she is Filipina transgender albino immigrant. So like, and she grew up in um, Philippines and then moved to Chino, California, and then went to Harvard. So she's had all sorts of interesting experiences of people not understanding what she is. But this book is pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, in the spirit of Filipino American History Month, I thought I'd plug some of my wonderful author friends. So, Anthony, could you type them in the chat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me type the names. Um, and I also posted your um, site for your books and let them know that they can get it through Stanford Press or Amazon because folks are asking where they can get your book. And I, I told them that you would autograph it when we <laughs> get face to face. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, that would be kind of fun. Very cool. Um, 
Kayla, are you still on? You had made a comment and I was saying, hey, you should say that to everyone or let me see. I'm um, sorry, I'm on and off this morning because my laptop kept dying. So I was on oh, my okay. iPad, but um, no, I just wanted to express like, thanks again to Anthony um, for always sharing your wisdom. And I just reiterated what he said earlier of like those stories that we don't hear um, are the ones that need to be heard, right? And so um, to just encourage you all, if you aren't hearing parts of your story to like look into it, like if it's not in the books and like talking with your family or like finding um, those parts that you can and sharing it with us because they're so powerful. So yeah, just thank you all for sharing. Yeah, and, and please introduce the work that you do. Yeah, I was going to just say, Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say like, if you don't know Kayla, you should because she is Hi everyone. So, um, my name is Kayla Kosaki. I use she her pronouns. I'm the coordinator for the Asian and Pacific Islander Student Center. And so in our center, similar to what y'all are learning in sociology and all of your classes, um, we have different programs and events to, for this like self-discovery to learn about like, who are we? What is our place in the world? What are some um, narratives that we haven't heard before? So, we have a couple dialogue series coming up and a lot of events throughout the year. So I'll just um, plug in some stuff in the chat, but again, just thank you all. And Kayla, yeah. please share that also with um, Kelly so she can promote it on our social media. Um, Kayla is also a part of the Webland Advisory Committee. So it's great to see you here Yay. as well. Um, I saw someone make a comment about Puerto Rican, like reading about Puerto Ricans. Um, I read a lot of sociology, but to be honest, like. I've been reading a lot of memoir and they've been my, that's like my favorite thing to read. And there's this wonderful book I just finished by Jakira Diaz. She's uh, black, she's black and she's black Puerto Rican. So she identifies as both black and Puerto Rican. And she wrote a book called Ordinary Girls about what it was like growing up in um, Miami. It's a really, really, that book, even I, I'm mentioning it and I'm getting goosebumps because that book is just pretty darn incredible. So. Liz, check it out. I saw that you made that comment. All right, very cool. Um, all right, do we have any other comments or questions? And thank you, um, Kayla, for putting the link up there. Um, and you know, I think one of the things that we hope that panels like this will do and webinars like this will do is to build community. And you know, even though you know we're far apart. Um, physically, socially, we don't have to be, right? So I, I actually prefer the notion of physical distancing versus social distancing, because I feel like we really need to connect socially more so than ever. And we welcome you to com continue the conversation and reach out to Dr. O, reach out to any of the other folks here and reach out with each other. Um, because I think the more stories that we share with each other, um, I don't know, I, I think it, it kind of makes situations a little palatable for <laughs> with what's going on right now is when we have more support and um, more sharing of stories like this and really great research. So thank you again, Dr. O, for a wonderful talk. And I hope that all of you enjoyed it. And I did um, take some, um, if I may, if, if you want to be in a picture, um, please yeah. um, <laughs> put your video on. If you don't want to be in the picture, take your video out. Because I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a, a group photo. So hold on one second. Um, hold on. All right. Hold on one second. And I'm sure Kelly's probably already done, done this as well. Uh, what was um, that a dog, Kayla? It's... Yeah, my puppy's behind me. <laughs> hold on. I'm having issues because I have too many tabs open. So hold she on. had to hear this talk too. It's oh, yeah. And you know, there are a lot of multi-ethnic dogs. <laughs> All right, I think I have it. All right, ready? Jeez. Yeah, we're gonna take a couple, so be ready. One, two, three. All right, let me close that. I don't know, I don't know if the second screen is open or not. Let me see. And Kelly, if you wanna take pictures too, feel free. All right, let me see if the second one is open. Oh yeah, we do have some open. All right. So, say cheese. 
All right, and then just one more in case I covered Dr. O's face on the last picture, because I think I did. We gotta get the speaker here. All right, thank you for bearing with me. For those of you who know me, I take tons of pictures. All right, cheese. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining. We're gonna have another webinar <laughs> next week. But um, later on today at four o'clock, the Department of Sociology in collaboration with the peer mentors are gonna be doing a um, sociology graduate school workshop. And it's, um, it's a conversation with myself and Dr. Daniels on whether is grad school right for you. So it is open to all majors. It is really geared more towards social sciences, but you're welcome to come. There is a separate link and it's on the Facebook page for sociology. And we do have a Wegland Facebook page and a Wegland website. So this will eventually be, be up there. So thank you all for coming and have a great Friday. And thanks again, Dr. O. Yay. Yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We have such nice students. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Danico. We'll see you later. Bye, Dolores. Um, excuse me, Dr. Danico. Yeah. Um, so I'm in a class. I'm in the English 1000 class, and we are supposed to come to an event that interests us, mm -hmm. and we need to take a screenshot. Is it okay if I take a screenshot of the Zoom meeting? Sure. I mean, I'm going to be posting the screenshot um, earlier, but you can take it right now if you want. I think Dr. O's already gone. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. Are you and I the only one left, Kelly? Well, everyone else is to here too. We'll, we'll just say wait, bye to everyone. It's like we're being good hosts. We're being good hosts. We're seeing everyone off. Yes. Goodbye. Have a nice day. All right, I'm going to end the recording.